The Lefanu Ballads by Neil Brand, based on the short stories of J. Sheridan Lefanu. Dublin, bustling European city. Took a hit after the Celtic Tiger, but bounced back and now doing just fine. We Dubliners walk pavements that are only a few feet above the fire pits of Viking settlers. Dig down a little and you will encounter more than clay. You'll find lives and decisions, saints and sinners. Because Dublin has a long memory and much of its past does not stay buried forever. The parcel of Dublin soil that interests me is accessed through a small door on Eustace Street with a neon sign above it. Two flights of concrete stairs lead down to a largish carpeted room with a bar, tables, armchairs and a stage. Sometimes there's entertainment on that stage, usually music, ballad singers. And once a year, something special happens. August the 28th, Lefano Night. People come specially. It's booked out months in advance. Hard to say why, something about the old fella, I guess. Sheridan Lefano, Dublin's own writer of ghost stories. Which is where I come in. I work here. The sign above the door says Sheridan's. It's my place. And he's buried alongside a crossword compiler. Well, two down and three across. <laughs> so, special night tonight. Raise your glasses, please, to Joseph Sheridan Lafano. Joseph Sheridan Lafano. Hey, where's Lula? Uh, me. <laughs> Our resident fairy princess, all set to charm your spirits out of your bodies and lead them in a dance. The Sirene of the Second Sight, <laughs> Lula O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> Though the clock may strike and the world may turn, there are debts to pay and truths to learn. There are some will soar and the some will burn. When they hear the Not a word, ladies and gentlemen. Let's not spoil the moment. Like I said, special night tonight. Nola has Buna Varginia, the second side, both a blessing and a curse. And there's one from the sea and three from the land. One from the sea. Is there a naval lady or gentleman in Sheridan's tonight? Here. Would you honor us with your name, sir? Barson. Lieutenant James Barton, Royal Navy. Well, good evening, Lieutenant. And uh, the lady with you? My fiance, Jeanette Montague. Soon to be his wife. Hooray! Charmed, I'm sure. Nola, got anything to say to Lieutenant Barton? Yes. I wouldn't walk home alone tonight. Oh, oh, oh I won't. <laughs> now it doesn't look like you're going to, Lieutenant. Slauncha. Slauncha. And there's one from the sea and three from the land A teacher of children, a judge so grand Is there somebody here who teaches a child singular? Me! I'm going to be homeschooling a child. <laughs> and you not much more than a child yourself, ma'am. Your name, please. <laughs> Laura Mildmay. Nola, do you have anything to say to Miss Mildmay? Yes. Believe the child. And take a Bible. A Bible, is it? Never thought Nola would turn Christian on us. Laura, you'll not forget your Bible now. Slauncha. Slauncha. Sing on, Nola, O oh daughter of the church. <laughs> <laughs> and an artist who lives by the skill of his hand. Oh, an artist, is it? Sure, they're usually too poor to afford this place. <laughs> I'm an artist. Indeed you are, Mr. Starkey, and Mr. Dow with you. Exceptions to every rule. As fine a pair of artists as the city of Dublin can muster and both in my bar. Slauncha. Slauncha. Uh, this is Rosie. Hi, Nula. Give us some good magic, will you, Nula? Nula doesn't get to choose her magic, Mrs. Starkey, do you, Nula? Do you have a word for the man? Indeed I have. They should not lie with the living. Well, now, what that may mean, your guess is as good as mine, ladies and gentlemen. 
This is bloody ridiculous, Lewis. You didn't want to come here in the first place. You said you wanted to come. Well, now I want to go. Come Just on. Lady Justice Harabin. Now look what you've done. Wretched girls recognise me. You must be the judge. So grand. I'm sorry if our little entertainment displeases you. Lady Justice Harabin. I have nothing to say to you. Do you have something to say to the lady, Nola? Yes. His trial will be yours. Oh, that's a tasty one to finish the night. This is bloody ridiculous. <laughs> Slancha, Lady Justice Harabin. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. We're not in the business of humiliating people in public. Where's that bloody taxi, Lewis? It's ringing. Nobody's picking up. It's just that Lafanu night has a bit of a reputation. People come expecting to see or hear something to their advantage. Noella won't play anywhere else in her trance thing. It's the real deal. She's not faking it. You will get out on the street and hail one. <laughs> I'll get soaked. Oh, it's your fault for suggesting that awful place. I thought you'd enjoy it. What does she mean about a trial? Get a bloody cab, will you? But dissatisfied customers are usually the exception. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant James Burton, what are you undoing? I always wanted to see what we could get away with on a dark street. You've unhooked my car. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Aren't you coming in then? I can't tonight. Early sailing tomorrow. Oh. Well, come in and I'll call a cab. No. If I come in, I'm lost to you for the night, I know it. So I'm going to walk my blameless body home to my sad, lonely bed and continue this conversation on Thursday. Mm. Oh, you can't <laughs> leave me like this. Watch me. Remember what Nuala said? I wouldn't walk home alone tonight. Don't walk home alone tonight. <laughs> Good night, my love. Good night, you beast. But maybe some people should take Lafanu night a bit more seriously than they do. Oh, Jeanette, this is ridiculous. You can't follow me. Hey, that's odd. <laughs> Who's there? Who's following me? Only a few streets to Lieutenant Barton's apartment. Just as well for his imagination is getting the better of him. Hello? Anybody there? It's the following morning, and three miles out of town on the Wicklow Road, Hello? Laura Mildmay finds herself outside the locked front door of an imposing three-storey Georgian house. Oh, sorry, I, I can't let you in. I'm supposed to be working here for Mrs Crowell. Yeah. Which Mrs. Crowell? Pamela's mother. Are you the new au pair? Yes. Are you Pamela? You can't come in until we've seen your ID. We're very particular. Can I at least come in and wait? No. Great. Uh, that's what they're like. Thank God I only have to fix the outside of the house. The nasty pieces of work. A lot of them. Old money. Yeah. You know, treat a fella like dirt. You're late. I've been waiting here for five minutes. Do you have some identification? Laura Mildmay. And your references? They're in my suitcase. Couldn't I show you those inside? Hmm. I suppose so. Come along in. Are you Pamela's mother? Pamela's parents are in Arizona. I run the house. You! Get down with your work! Yes, ma'am. You old bitch. Oh, nice room. You'll take your meals with us and you'll spend most of the day in Pamela's rooms. I've got my own apartment. Here are the keys to the front door, Pamela's room and your room. We recommend keeping your room locked. Why? The upper floor is strictly out of bounds, as those are Mr and Mrs Crowell's rooms. And Granny's. You will find everything you need on these two floors. Now, I'll leave you two to get acquainted. Thank you, Mrs... Wyvern. Meg Wyvern. She's a bitch. Pamela? Well, she is. If Mummy and Daddy knew half the things she gets up to here, they'd throw her out and call the police. I don't believe it. She took away my phone last week and won't give it back. And why did she do that? Because I... You what? I was watching YouTube at one in the morning. Sounds reasonable. 
Much too late for a 15-year-old. I knew you'd be boring. I'm going out. Good. I'm coming with you. But you don't know where I'm going. That's all right. I'll follow you. It'll help me find my way around. Seat yourself. I'm going upstairs. Mrs Wyvern says I can't go up there. That's right. You can't. I wonder why. Around the same time, Mr Gerald Dow, the artist, is in his studio, tracing the gorgeous curves of Miss Cathy Constantine onto a new canvas. Gerald! Oh, God. Where the hell are you? In here, Gordon, I'm working. You're not going to bloody believe this. Get yourself dressed and give me ten minutes, will you, Cathy? Can I smoke on your balcony? Don't let anybody see you. It'll negate my insurance. (sighs) There you are. Look, Rosie's disappeared. Morning, Mr Stark. Not a word in two days. Nice to see you too. Rosie's not your property, you know. <laughs> I've been calling and texting and she won't answer. It seems she doesn't want to talk to you. What am I supposed to do about it? Well, she's your niece. And what's that got to do with anything? I, I thought... Well, you thought a couple of nights out on a snog meant that you were an item. You introduced us. Naturally, I thought you'd hit it off. I can't help it if I was wrong, can I? But, well, I, I really like her. Gerald Dow has known Gordon Starkey for years. He mentored him, got him his first exhibition. Is there somebody else? How should I know? Is there somebody else? For God's sake, Gordon, piss off and let me work, will you? Get on with that St. Mike study of yours. It's gorgeous. Sell for a packet when you're done. I don't care about the money. Of course you do. We all do. Look, if I hear from her, I'll tell you straight away and I'll drop round later and take you to dinner. What do you say? So, Starkey returns to his own studio and plunges back into the work that Dow has praised so highly. A close study of the vault of St Michael's Church, whose medieval archways and coffin mummies were said to have inspired Bram Stoker. Oh, the devil. Who's there? Rosie. Where... where have you been? (laughs) Where have I been? I've been looking for you everywhere. I... I... What's the matter? I... I don't know where I've been. God, Rosie, who's done this to you? Done what? Have you... have you taken something? Your eyes, your pupils are pinpricks. Oh, he... he gave me pills. Who? Van der Hosen. Who... who is that? Don't... don't leave me, Gordy. Don't... don't leave me. Gerald, I've got Rosie. She's here. I think she's been drugged. Okay, okay. Come over right away. Come on, love. Let's get you onto the bed. Mr. Starkey? Jesus! Who the hell are you? How did you get in here? Indeed, the gaunt stranger in the expensive coat and Gucci shades appeared to have emerged from the very darkness. I was concerned for Miss Stowe. She has been in my care for the last couple of days. She is in a very bad way. What do you mean? I run a private clinic. Miss Dow was committed to my care. By who? That is confidential. (laughs) It is vital that she gets the help she needs. I have an ambulance waiting downstairs. I'm coming with her. That will not be possible. The terms of her confinement are very strict. Well, then we'll wait until Mr. Dow arrives. I suspect Mr. Dow is not coming. On the other hand, I see the guardie drawing up outside. It would be for the best if you were to step aside. But this is a legal matter. Indeed it is. Miss Dow has taken ketamine. They will want to ask you about that. It is, after all, a date rape drug. I've given her nothing. She just came in here like this. My clinic is an addiction clinic, Mr. Starkey. Patients escape and seek out their dealers. Are you going to let the guardie in, Mr. Starkey? Come. It's a couple of days later at the Naval Service Headquarters in Cork. Dr. Knight? Lieutenant Commander, actually. Come in, Lieutenant. And Lieutenant Barton can no longer outrun those mysterious footsteps. I'm sorry, ma'am, I should have checked. Navy psychiatrists are rare enough, those of us with rank rarer still. Does Captain Jenner know you're here? No. Then I shouldn't really be seeing you. I was hoping... Yes? ...that I might talk to you in confidence. Go on. I'm currently on a month's shore leave after my tour of duty with Dolphin. I know. I've got your record here. We put into Lisbon for two days. Uh, A rating went missing. I heard. Died ashore. Possible suicide. I denied him shore leave, but he went anyway. 
I led the party ashore to find him, but he jumped out of a third-story apartment. I see. Is that why you wanted to see me? No. I wanted to ask, is it possible for PTSD to cause hallucinations? You're seeing things that aren't there? Hearing them. Someone behind me, constantly. Another set of footsteps following me for minutes on end, and when I turn, there's nobody there. Then recently I've heard laughter. Someone laughing. Very quiet, very close. You're sure of this? As sure as I'm sitting here. You say you found the body of the rating? Well, a Portuguese girl found him. Local police called us in. Do you get nightmares? Flashbacks to seeing the body? No. Headaches? Yes. There's something you're not telling me. Something else I heard. This weekend, coming back from Croke Park after a match, big crowd of people, I heard... Still alive then, Barton. What? Who said that? Still alive. What the hell? What's the matter? Who said that? Who said what? Somebody said... Ah, it, it doesn't matter. Such a crush of people could be him for anybody. Did you recognise the voice? Slow ahead. Slow ahead, eh? Thank you, Cox. Starboard watch. Watch? Aye, sir. Eyes peeled, Yelland. Should be alight at about 700 yards. Very good, sir. You prick. What did you just say? Nothing, sir. Watch, aye. 700 yards. No. No, it wasn't a voice I recognised. So, what do you want me to do? I'm terrified these issues will interfere with my work if I go back to sea. Can you recommend a period of leave for me, ma'am? On condition you go to your commanding officer and tell him what you've told me, then it'll be up to him to decide what to do. You do believe me, don't you? I think there's something going on. Possibly something that could affect your decision-making. I'll write you a letter if Commander Jenner requests one. OK? And now it's the following night, pitch black, early hours. Laura Mildmay lies in bed, her Bible unread on the bedside table. There is nobody behind the curtains, ma'am, nor behind your mirror. And now Laura's eyes are open. She can't believe what she's hearing. There is no devil, ma'am. It's not my face. What she's talking about there. There. What on earth? You are imagining things, ma'am. Your Bible and prayer book are there beside you. You need fear no evil. Now, please, take this medicine. It will... Oh, look what you've done. You know what this means. Get her away. Who's there? It's only me. Can I come in? That's my granny up there. Come and sit on the bed with me. She's having one of her turns. What does she do? Here comes wife and she'll go to the cupboard on the landing. Whatever's that? It's some sort of harness. They put it on granny so she can't hurt herself. Good grief. Now, ma'am, please let me get this on you. You know it's necessary to wait for me. 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 But where, I hear you murmur, is the irascible Lady Justice Horribin? She sounded a feisty dame, whatever could her knight at Sheridan's have left her with. Noela said, his trial will be yours. I wonder whose trial? You can't do that! Watch me. It's the following day, out on the gusty slopes of Meadow Park. One thing you should understand about Lady Justice Horribin, she has something of a reputation. I am managing director. You were until you made me joint CEO. Well, then we own it jointly. All decisions need both our signatures. Don't you dare quote the law at me, Lewis. She has never actually stepped outside the absolute letter of the law. She's too cunning for that. 
She has the character of being, however, a dangerous and unscrupulous judge. I have given you quite a bit of money, Lewis, over these last months. Yes, to build up the business. You said you supported what I did. No, I do. But if you remember, you signed over your apartment as surety. What? And to be frank, the price of the apartment doesn't begin to cover the huge amounts of money I've poured into your pet project. This place means everything to me. Saving the meadows is the only worthwhile thing I've ever done. Ah, the meadows. A plot of green countryside surrounding a modest mansion in the outskirts of the city. Privately owned, but publicly available to the community for recreational purposes. With plans for a library, community centre, playground and skate park. Thanks to you, I have a substantial sum sunk into this place. I told you I'd pay it back. You did. I'd like it now, please. I haven't got it now. Which is where we came in. And, unfortunately, prime real estate for developers without too many scruples. And a receptive judge to nudge through their planning orders. I left Jessica for you. That was our apartment. Oh, do. Go back to Jessica, by all means. I'm sure she'll take you in. If you insist on this repayment, you'd break me. Oh, please. Everything I've built up, the development fund will collapse if I can't keep making those payments. Then I'll buy you out. I've already spoken to the other trustees. They are quite prepared for you to step down as MD. Oh, yes. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Good little Lewis handing over the keys to this gorgeous plot for you to do with as you wish. That really won't happen. Then, Lewis, with the greatest of pleasure, I'll see you in court. See what I mean. And with that merry repast, Lady Justice Horribin heads off to her day job, whilst we return to the house on the Wicklow Road. Come on, Pamela, try again. Which George was King of England during the American War of Independence? George the Dad. Yes! And a couple of mates who That's once were teacher and pupil. So... Which one's the Georgian period named after? Fourth, mainly. Reigned from 1820 to 1830. That's when this house was built. 1826. Has it always been in your family? No. Granny married the Squire Crowell just before the Second World War. How old is your granny, then? She's coming up on her hundredth birthday. Wow! She was evidently a great beauty. Came to nurse the Squire after he lost his son. In the war? No. He was just a little boy, he used to wander off all the time. One day wandered off and never came back. They found his hat under a hawthorn tree by the lake. Poor Mr Crowell. Granny gave him my dad and my uncle, so he was happy again. He must have loved my granny. Gave her so many beautiful clothes and jewels. They're still packed away upstairs. Do you want to see her? See who? Granny. You'll get me fired. She's never awake this early. Mrs Wyvern's downstairs. Don't you want to see her dresses? Ah, the curiosity of youth. My goodness. A four-poster bed. Wyvern always keeps the curtains closed. Look over here. The whole room is an Art Deco boudoir. Gorgeous furniture, a dressing table straight out of the Ritz circa 1935, and wardrobes, one, two, three of them. Look, all Granny's dresses. Tapata, free, rayon, silk, velvet. I'd love to try them all on, but I don't. For now, I just take them out, feel them, hold them up in front of that long mirror. But Laura has less interest in the clothes and more in the body that wore them. Do you want to see her? She'll be fast asleep, it's all right. And the girls creep to the bed and Pamela gently pulls the curtain aside. Oh, my word. You see, she sleeps in her gowns, sewn with pearls and sequins, just as she did when she was young. Satin and silk and scarlet and green and gold and lace. A blonde wig with curls cascading down to her shoulders and her old baggy throat all powdered white. And there she lies. She's beautiful. The two girls can't let go of the curtain, nor move an inch, nor take their eyes off her, their very hearts standing still. Mrs Wyvern makes her up to please her when she stands before that mirror. But below her eyelids... 
There's nothing there. And there is still nothing there as Madame Crow's eyes snap open and she sits up, <laughs> spins herself around and down with her with a clack of her two tall heels on the floor, facing the girls, ogling their faces with her two great glassy eyes. You little limbs. What for did you say I killed the boy? I'll tickle you till you're stiff. <laughs> And as the girls back away in sheer horror, she comes clattering after like a thing on wires, with her fingers pointing to their throats, and she making all the time a sound with her tongue like. <laughs> no! Get up! Get up! No! no! <laughs> Next time, perhaps you'll listen to me. Did you hear what she said? She talks nonsense. Take no notice of her. She said she killed a boy. What? It's true, Mrs. Wyvern. What boy? There is no boy. There is nothing but ashes and devils in that old brain. <laughs> Get away. Get back. I have my Wyvern. Tell me again. Eat it, your monster. <laughs> Thanks to you two, I have my work cut out now to calm her. I will duck you a week's wages for breaking your contract, Laura Moyles May. You're damn lucky I'm not firing you. Go back to your lessons, Aperia. But that's enough. I wonder if you're beginning to realise the significance of Sheridan's in general, and Newell's ballads in particular. There are those walking the streets of Dublin with untroubled consciences who will live and die with no heavy burden crushing their souls. James, aren't you going to answer that? It'll just be a spam call. I'm getting ten a day. There are others who have buried events so deep they could never be recalled. Look, let's clear away and go out. We can drive to the coast, find somewhere to eat tonight. I don't fancy it. You've barely been out of the house in a fortnight. You're on sick leave, not under house arrest. Unless the events themselves are somehow making their presence felt. Oh, this is ridiculous. Leave it. It's just a voicemail. I said leave it. Lieutenant Barton must come abroad as usual and show himself to his friends out of doors or else prepare for a visit in his own chamber. Signed, Starboard Watch. <laughs> it's a joke. Your mess mate's taking the piss about you having sick leave. Isn't it? Well, it's just a joke. Surely, James. <laughs> James! Oh, God help me. Poor Lieutenant Barton. He is the first to see a dark future for himself. Others are not so lucky. Gordon Starkey has hired an expensive lawyer, David McCrone, to get access to his beloved Rosie, immured in the Vanderhausen Clinic, and the legal process is just beginning. This is what we would call a tribunal for direction. As it's a mental health matter under the 1983 Act, the judge may decide he needs an expert witness on a date to be set. So don't get your hopes up for a quick decision. I'm not. That's fine. We've got decent new medical evidence to question the findings of the medical tribunal. <sighs> Look, Rosie was clean a week ago. Never taken drugs in her life. I'll swear to it. And we have a good case for referring Vanderhausen's clinic to the regulatory authorities. Right? All right! And I can just bet you know who will walk into that court. Be seated. Mr. McCrown. Ma'am, my client, Mr. Gordon Starkey, is bringing a case against the Vanderhausen Clinic for wrongful sectioning of Miss Rosie Dye under the 1983 Mental Health Act. Is your client a member of Miss Dye's family? No, ma'am. Then what possible interest can he have in this case? He and Miss Dye are in a relationship, ma'am. Were they indeed? And what new evidence do you bring to overturn the finding of the medical tribunal? Miss Dye's medical history shows no previous use of illegal substances, let alone addiction, which was the finding of the tribunal. Is that it? Ma'am? Am I right in thinking that your client is a reasonably wealthy man? Well, that is hardly relevant. This is my court. I will decide what is relevant. The fact of the matter is that your client, finding himself at odds with a legal decision to section Miss Dow, thought that he could buy himself a High Court ruling to reverse the judgment. He then compounded his arrogance by sending you, a young man I have, until now, rather admired for your tenacity, to plead on his behalf with almost no material evidence to support his case. Ma'am, I must protest. My direction is that this case has no merit whatsoever. 
and any further action will merely be a waste of the court's time. And if you wish to protect your reputation, Mr. Macrone, I would be rather more careful whose money you accept to act for them in future. Case dismissed. And she might reasonably be expected to see that as the end of the affair, except that when she walks back into her chambers... What are you doing here? I've just come from the meadows. And? There's fencing up. The gates are locked. There are signs saying private property. That's right. The meadows are no longer open to the public until a dispute that has arisen has been resolved. Dispute? What dispute? It seems the local council has invited offers for development of the area as a retail park. What? It also seems that the Trust could not agree on a way forward in light of the Chairman standing down and subsequent financial irregularities being discovered. Irregularities? Come. Oh, uh... I'm sorry, I didn't realise you were in a consultation. It's all right, Mr Dow, I'm not. Mr O'Donnell was just leaving. How do we resolve this business with the meadows? You've got more pressing concerns, Lewis. Like, how did charitable donations to the meadows end up in your bank account? You've done this! I would be extremely careful what you say to me in front of witnesses, Lewis. What was all that about? None of your business. Stark is warned off, as I promised. Good. Thank you. You really are a piece of work, Dow. Selling off your niece to Vanderhausen in this day and age is impressive. She's gorgeous. I hope he's paid you as well as he's paid me. I don't know. Oh dear. Better ask him for a bit more. And while you're at it, tell him that none of this had better come back to me. I'm in line for appointment to the Supreme Court, and whilst his financial backing is welcome, a paper trail to your niece is not. We are all of us in the clear. We'd better be. Out of interest. Have you met Mr. Vanderhausen? Not personally. No, neither have I. Starkey has, but... Good grief! What's going on? What's going on is an everyday tragedy for those with no hope of the future. Lewis O'Donnell has walked out of the courts of justice and under the wheels of an oncoming delivery van. To Gordon Starkey, heading away in despair of helping his Rosie, it looks like an accident. But to those of us concerned with these things, it looks more like a case of cold-blooded murder. Starkey himself has wended his weary way back to his studio. Outside, the sky has turned dark and thundery. He continues to work, using the lowering weather outside and his own dark frustrations to bring life to the cold walls of St. Michael's. He paints detail of stone and crevice, coffin lid and sheeted corpse with a finesse and an eye that is breathtaking until Rosie help me Gordy you're soaked where's your coat quickly shut the door lock it you must be freezing I'm starving I can barely stand didn't they feed you in that place do you know a priest a priest I must have a priest I'm not safe until he comes please find me a priest you need food don't leave me no please, please don't. Starkey goes into his kitchen his mind racing. Have you run away from the clinic? A priest? A meal is what you need. Then you have to tell me everything. Are the police after you? A priest can deliver me. The dead can never lie with the living. God has forbidden it. They should not lie with the living. The dead and the living? Oh no, the lights are fused. Oh God! He's here! He's here! See! See there he's Rosie! Rosie, what's happening? He's here. He's pouring me in the room. Rosie! <laughs> Rosie! <laughs> the room is empty. The window open. And Starkey springs to a chair and gazes out upon the street and the canal below. He sees, or thinks he sees, the waters of the broad canal beneath settling ring after ring in heavy circles, as if a moment before disturbed by the submission of some ponderous body. Laura? Yes, Pamela, what is it? I'm trying to get sleep. Thank you for sleeping in my room. It's all right, I don't mind. Weeks have passed, and in the big Georgian pile on the Wicklow Road, Madame Crowell has gone to her final rest. I wasn't lying to you. I know. I have seen her. Here. Late at night. 
I've woken up and seen her in that mirror. Madame Crowell's long mirror, in front of which she primped and purred in her declining years, now stands tall and dark in Pamela's bedroom. Oh, God, what is it? I, I see her too. Look. <gasps> and for sure, there in the depths of the mirror, her eyes as wide as saucers and dressed in her satins and velvets, walks Madame Crowell, getting closer, then up to the mirror's glass and on out of the frame and into the room with the terrified girls. I, I can't bear it. You must. Watch. Watch where she goes. There's a strange red light around her clothes as though her feet are on fire. But the air as she passes is cold. Is that where she went before? That's the place. For Madame Crowell's ghost has veered past the girls, staring in their beds and disappeared into an alcove at the end of the room, where she opens a door and seems to be rummaging inside for something. See that door? There's no door there. No. And now she disappears. And she did. The strange, lurid red figure seems to snuff out like a candle's end and the room is dark as before. Well, can you see anything? Give us a minute now. It's the following morning. Mrs Wyvern has taken suspiciously little persuading that the girls had witnessed something extraordinary in Pamela's room and has fallen in with their suggestion that inquiries should be made. Well, the plaster's covering something. It looks like the panels of a door. Boy, the saints. Excuse me a moment. Where's she going? How should I know? Well, ca careful there, ladies. Oh, well, I never... Beneath the plaster, it looks like a steel door. Ah, there's a keyhole here. I'm not sure I can get inside this. It appears to be flush with the frame. It's some sort of a, a safe or a, or a strong room. Here, I think you'll need this. Where did you find that? In the drawer of your grandmother's dressing table. I know every door in this house and couldn't find the lock that would take this key. Here. Thank you, ma'am. I can't look. Miss, do you have a phone with a torch? Of course. Here. The room had been a vault for plate or jewels back in the day, but now it seemed empty as the workman's light played into its recesses. Until... God, what's that? A heap of mummified bones and garments lying in one corner of the vault. A cat... Got trapped in there. Poor thing. That's no cat. He pokes the little body with his crowbar and down it tumbles altogether. Oh, my God. Head and all in a heap of bones and dust. Whatever is it? It's the boy. What boy? No, that's too horrible. That's a sailor suit. What are you talking about? I think that's the son of Squire Crowell from his first marriage. The boy they thought had drowned in the lake. But how did your grandmother... He stood to inherit the estate, not her children, him. There was nothing to be said. All minds were racing, but Meg Wyvern put into words what they were all thinking. She went to her grave, knowing he was there. She's never going to rest, is she? You see, Sheridan's isn't just about punishing the wicked. It's about winkling out the good people who can shine light in dark corners. Sure, some people are beyond saving and will never sleep easy in the knowledge of what they've done. James, 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 wake up. We're having another nightmare. Oh, God. Come here, my darling. Cuddle up. There are others whose very consciences plague them. Not like old Madame Crow with her 80-year-old secret. Why can't I sleep? Just suffering with the shame of one wrong step, one miscalculation. Come on, settle down, my darling. That to their lasting regret can never be put right. That's it. Sleep, my love. <sighs> Who are you? We've met before, Lieutenant Barton. 
You're the girl from Sheridan's with the second sight. Where is this place? A place of safety. It's beautiful. It is. It's somewhere I can bring you two together. Us two? Mr. Barton? Yellen, you've been watching me. Oh, God. I'm... I'm sorry. Now we're getting somewhere. You know what happened that day in Lisbon. Yellen! Open up! Lieutenant Barton. You're under arrest. Going ashore without permission. Where's the armed guard? Get rest. Well, hang on. You came on your own. You haven't reported this, have you? Get some clothes on and come with me or well, I'll... You're what? Drag me through the streets on your own? <laughs> I'd like to see you try. You're an insubordinate little bastard. You have been from the start. I've got a girl coming back here in a few minutes. So if you want a piece of me, get on with it. <laughs> I've been wanting to do this since Pompey. I love you, Barton. I love you for assault. I didn't mean to. You pack a punch? I was unconscious before I hit the ground. I slipped back aboard without being seen and waited until the police called. Took the shore party out myself in case there was anything incriminating. I had a wife and two kids waiting for me back home. It's not right. It's not right. No. Then you know what you have to do. And afterwards, you can walk alone after dark as often as you wish. Come. Captain Jenner. Hello, Grace. Come on in. What can I do for you? Come in, Lieutenant. Sir? Barton. What's all this about? Tell Captain Jenner what you told me. It's about able seaman Yellen, sir. Died ashore in Lisbon. What about him? I was there when he died, sir. We had a fight. He fell out of a third-story window. It was an accident. I, I just meant to overpower him and bring him back to the ship. Good God. And the rest, Barton. Yelland was an excellent seaman, sir. Stood his watch well. Should have made PO within a couple of years. His wife never got full pension because he was AWOL when he died. I but... see. You, you realise there'll have to be a court-martial, Barton? Yes, sir. I will appear as a character witness for Lieutenant Barson. I can't see how this can result in anything other than dishonourable discharge. Probably a criminal charge. I'm aware of that, Captain. So, I believe, is the Lieutenant. Why are you telling us all this now? Tired of being watched, sir. You will prioritise looking after Yellen's family, won't you, sir? And there you have it. I like to think we provide a service at Sheridan's. Writing wrongs, giving folk a second chance. Mind you, there are times when it's all too late. But we can still step in. For we find dreams are very useful things. Where am I? You're asleep in your bed, Mr. Starkey. You've taken a Valium, as you have done every night since Rosie died. You're the girl from the club. They should not lie with the living. That's what Rosie said. The dead should not lie with the living. Do you trust me, Mr. Starkey? Enough to follow me? Follow you where? To find some answers. Now, the problem with answers is they're not always the ones you want to hear. But this is the crypt at St. Mikan's. No, it's not. We're in your painting, Mr. Starkey. Good God. You have a wonderful eye for detail. Here's the vault you're in the process of committing to canvas. It's... it's different. Yes, it is. Not the bricks and mortar. They haven't changed in centuries. But maybe... the occupants. Starkey! Help me! Gerald! I wouldn't touch him if I were you. But he's alive. He's in that coffin. Oh, no, he isn't. Not alive, anyway. They'll find him at a weekend when the public tours begin again. How horrible. He made the mistake of demanding more money from Vanderhausen. He what? He sold your beloved Rosie, his own niece, to Vanderhausen. Who do you think tipped off the police? Gerald Dow. 
Vanderhausen offered him an enormous sum to get his hands on her. So Gerald Dow paved the way. All the way. Then he got greedy. Then... Then what? He met Vanderhausen. In the flesh, as it were. I can't believe he'd do that to Rosie. To me. Believe it. He was always more interested in money than art anyway. And you were getting very like him. But who is Vanderhausen? Ah, at last. The question we've all been asking. Do you want to know? Of course. Even if you can do nothing about what you see. Now, there's a poser. For which one of us would wish to see horrors we can do nothing to change? Perhaps I can. Perhaps you can. Rosie, what is... Quiet now, Mr. Starkey. She can't tell you anything. Only show you. As so often in dreams, we move imperceptibly from one arena to another. In Starkey's case, from the reeking dust-covered walls of St. Michael's to the white-tiled hygienic walls of the Vanderhausen Clinic, following his dead lover, who seems to be smiling as she leads him down corridor after corridor until eventually pushing through white double doors to a vast, empty hall. Well... Not quite empty. What is that? Why don't you go and look? Lying atop a slab beneath a white sheet as in a mortuary lies the decomposed corpse grey body of Vanderhausen, seemingly at peace. No. Rosie. Don't. She is showing you. The slab is wide enough for a second body. Rosie climbs onto it and lies down beside Vanderhausen, whose head suddenly turns towards Starkey, the eyes opening to reveal dead white pupils and a ghastly smile playing across the toothless gums. Oh, dear God. Paint it. Paint the picture. I... I can't. Yes, you can. Paint it. And he did. You can see it in the Museum of Modern Art to this day. A smiling girl pointing to a figure on a slab as a young man staggers back in horror. Take a look, it'll freak you out. It's called They Should Not Lie With The Living. All right, Lady Justice Harabin presiding. Ah, yes, of course. Always and inevitably we return to Lady Justice Harabin who is doing just fine. Be seated. The Director of Public Prosecutions versus Lieutenant James Barton. Council, approach the bench. Better than fine, actually, for our Lady Judge is about to be appointed to the Supreme Court of Ireland. Mr McCrone, I've read your defence of this case and I have to say I'm not convinced it's worthy of appeal. Ma'am, there are mitigating circumstances. There always are, young man, but murder is murder. Unless you have proof that this young sailor intended to commit suicide, I have no choice but... Lady Justice Horobin has just seen a face in the crowd, one she didn't expect to see. Ma'am? It, it, it's not possible. You were saying, ma'am? F -f Fifteen minutes adjournment. Ma'am? You heard me. The court officials are left wondering and still more so when Lady Justice Horobin doesn't appear for the rest of the day. And none of them in their wildest dreams could have imagined that what had taken her back so thoroughly was the sight of Lewis O'Donnell, his head a mass of blood, smiling at her from the public gallery. Blast this bloody traffic. Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. How long to the Department of Justice? Only a few minutes now, ma'am. That evening, it's Lady Justice Horobin's big night. Dinner at the Department of Justice before her elevation to the Supreme Court tomorrow. No wonder she's in a bit of a state in the back of her limo. Oh, for God's sake, we're in the wrong lane. Why are you taking us into Temple Bar? Excuse me. And with a perceptible, all the door locks go on. What the, what the hell are you doing? The panel behind the driver slowly descends 
and Lady Justice Horribin gets her first good look at her driver. Mom? Lewis, sit tight. Soon be there. No. No! No! The car picks up speed, its terrified occupant no. pushing at the doors and beating at the tinted windows to escape. Until, to her amazement, Horribin realises she is staring through the car window at a bleak, desolate moorland stretching lifelessly from right to left, with rotting trees pointing fantastic branches in the air as if they held up their arms and twigs like fingers in horrible glee at the judge's coming. And through them comes staggering a gaunt figure in the rags of once beautiful clothes, a strange red light like flames playing about her feet. Here she is. Should be gallows waiting for that one. Dear God, what is that awful thing? Her name is Madame Crowell. She was particularly keen to see your trial. Trial? What trial? It is as you were told all those long months ago. His trial will be yours. He's a corpse. That's your friend, Vanderhausen. Vanderhausen! Thank God, get me out of this, I'll pay you anything. String the bitch up. It's all her kind on the stands. If it wasn't for her, I'd be alive today. I, I, I don't know these people. You don't get it, do you, ma'am? They're all dead. Come on, let's get you ready for the judge. The judge? The judge. For his trial will be yours. And Lady Justice Horribin emerges from the back of her limousine, blinking in bright stage lights, an audible hiss from an unseen audience in the darkness beyond. Where the hell is this? Close, Your Honour, but no cigar. Your trial is slated to take place in a venue of the judge's choosing. He has had the excellent taste to suggest my club. Oh, Royce! What about my inauguration? Where is this? What the hell is going on? Quiet! The Honourable Justice Lewis O'Donnell presiding. Oh, dear God. Think yourself lucky it's not every prisoner gets driven to court by the judge trying their case. Prisoner at the bar, you stand accused of the following crimes. Corruption, financial and moral. Conspiracy to commit a crime. Fraud on a grand scale. Bullying and misdirection of juries and ultimately... Murder. I didn't murder anybody. You didn't murder anybody. How dare you stand there and lie in my court? You made no question of what would become of the people who would lose the meadows if it was ploughed under. Those who take their leisure and recreation there. I was once your lover, but became merely an obstacle to your ambitions. So I had to be bullied out of the way. You killed yourself. That was no affair of mine. You see... Ladies and gentlemen, even now, this narcissist can't see the scale of her own iniquity. Tell me, madam, if none of this were to come to light, would you take your seat on the Supreme Court, even with all these crimes loaded on the scales against you? Of course. Wait, what do you mean, if? Be quiet! Oh, this is a nightmare! None of this is real. I'm asleep. In my bed at home. You have no power over me. Well, if that is indeed the case... I know it is. Then you won't mind pleading guilty, will you? How conscience doth make cowards of us all. Of course I'll sign, if only to please my subconscious. Will the clerk of the court present the indictment to the prisoner? Uh, there you go, ma'am. It's pretty weighty. Lean it on the dock there. May I go now? You may. And may God have mercy on your soul. Take her down! And Lady Justice Horribin awakes as the passenger door is opened. We're here, ma'am. Justice Department. Sorry about the delay. The traffic was murder tonight. I... Uh... <laughs> yes, thank you. And she walks up the stairs to the banqueting hall where she will be fated as the next Justice of the Supreme Court. It was a matter of some hilarity throughout the city of Dublin when a senior judge was arrested at her own inauguration after a signed confession had been discovered on the hard drive of her laptop. Suffice to say, inquiries were made into Lady Justice Horribin's financial affairs 
and multiple instances of fraud and corruption were discovered. Lights out! The lady now resides at the state's pleasure for many years to come. Nate Judge! Oh, shut up! You might think that's not much of a punishment for so dangerous a creature, but let me assure you... <coughs> Who's there? She does have company. Hello, ma'am. No. No! So, special night tonight. Raise your glasses, please. You know who to? Joseph Sheridan Lefanu! There's a myth going round that the old fella buried himself away studying the occult and eventually died of fright, but I don't think that's true. Do you? No! no. Nola, do you have a word for anybody here tonight? Or listening to this on their radio? I do. Could it be you, sir? Or you, madam? Or maybe you. In the Lefanu Ballads, written by Neil Brand, based on J. Sheridan Lefanu's short stories The Watcher, Madame Crowell's Ghost, Shalkin the Painter, and Lord Justice Harbottle, the MC was played by Paul Chahidi. Lady Justice Horobin by Hayden Gwynn. Lewis and Starkey by Jonathan Forbes. Nula and Laura by Ruth Everett. Barton and McCrone by Matthew Durkin, Pamela and Jeanette, Alex Hannant, Grace and Meg Wyvern, Rebecca Crankshaw, Yelland, Chris Jack, Gerald Dow, Michael Begley, and Vanderhausen and the Workman, Neil McCall. The Lefanu Ballads was a BBC audio production for Radio 4, directed by Tracy Neal. Mm-hmm.